My guest is Max Wilbert, who, along with co-authors Lear Keith and Derek Jensen, wrote the book Bright Green Lies, How the Environmental Movement Lost Its Way and What We Can Do About It. Max, how are you today? I'm doing good, Hart. Nice to be with you. It's great to be with you. I'm a big fan of your your work, your book, and your movie. Uh, Max, what motivated you to write the book Bright Green Lies, How the Environmental Movement Lost Its Way and What We Can Do About It? Well, in a way, it was a very personal motivation. I started to become an environmentalist at a pretty young age, and I was taught from the very beginning that solar panels, wind turbines, electric vehicles were going to save us. And I'm lucky to some extent that I grew up in an environment, I was surrounded by older activists, grassroots environmentalists who hung on to the older values of the environmental movement. Uh, things like moderation, reducing and critiquing consumption and capitalism, and the role of uh, advertising in shaping our so-called needs. Uh, so I never fully bought into the idea that these technologies were going to save us. At best, I, or at worst, I should say, I only thought of them as stopgap measures to reduce harms as we transition to a sustainable way of life. Uh, but what I saw begin to happen very rapidly uh, throughout the last 20 years is a transition where the environmental movement, which was once focused on protecting habitat, defending wild places and wild creatures, has shifted almost entirely to focus on global warming and specifically on addressing global warming through technology. And I see this as a huge problem, not because uh, I support fossil fuels or I believe global warming isn't a problem. It's the exact opposite. It's because I believe these are both inadequate solutions to global warming and because I think they're ultimately destructive to the planet as a whole. They're counterproductive to the environmental movement's goals. Um, but uh, of course, they become very popular, these technological so-called solutions. And I think it's mainly because they're profitable uh, uh, industrial products that you can sell. There's a lot of money involved. And uh, you know that money has gotten governments on board. It's gotten corporations on board. It's led to a lot of foundation funding and big philanthropy money for nonprofits that promote this type of thing. And that has led to uh, the entire environmental movement, the entire climate movement being uh, you know, focused almost with blinders on this one single approach. Well, I bet the uh, environmental movement has welcomed you with open arms and given you nothing but positive feedback. How's that gone? <laughs> uh it's it's a mixed bag because i would say that at the grassroots level there are a lot of environmentalists who understand these issues and who have never lost sight of the fundamental values of this movement you know a love and reverence for the planet and for other beings and creatures around us a real um criticism and uh mistrust uh, justified mistrust of technological solutions and especially solutions that are led by corporations and major international institutions to solving these issues. Um, those people, I think, understand somewhat intuitively that the technological solutions to global warming are a farce to to uh, to some extent. With that said, a lot of those people have been superficially convinced that that's the way forward. So in some ways, it feels like when I talk to those people, I'm helping them to rediscover their own beliefs in some cases. I'm making it okay for them to say out loud what they really believe in their hearts, which is that this is a problem in this direction that, that, we're, that we're seeing the movement go in. Then on the other side, you have the more mainstream environmentalists and especially more mainstream climate activists, um, the institutional uh, you know, organizations, the large NGOs and so on. Um, and you have people in government and business 
who are very convinced that this is the path forward, that technology is going to save us. Um, those people are hard to reach. And uh, those people, in my experience, will often attack someone like me to say that I'm a shill for the fossil fuel industry, that I must be getting paid by the oil companies to talk about these things, that I'm getting in the way of progress, and, uh, and or will just completely ignore me and try to uh, focus on the work that they're doing to promote these technologies. Well, such people seem to really believe that these technological solutions are the way. And if we would just adopt them and fund them and subsidize them and get behind them, then we could be at this happy place in the future. Or at least, you know, things are so bad, we have to pull out all the stops. And pulling out all the stops means engineering solutions. You know, solar panels, wind turbines, electric cars, carbon capture and storage, we have to do everything we can possibly do. So that includes generating our energy differently. Yeah, and I think a lot of that mindset emerges from an unwillingness to grapple with the reality of overshoot. You know, to, to my perspective, I'm not sure if your audience is familiar with the term overshoot, but uh, you know, overshoot is about carrying capacity. Mm -hmm. um, a given habitat or a given planet can only sustain so many beings, so many life forms living a certain way of life. And ecologists use a formula to calculate this. They talk about population times affluence times technology equals impact. And you know, it's not an exact formula. It's a thought experiment. It's a way of approaching these issues and understanding um, our impacts on the planet. So, of course, that formula means that rich people have far greater impact on the planet on average than poor people do, and uh, that people who are using you know, highly advanced forms of modern technology have far more impact than those that are using more, more basic, more grassroots technologies, right? So uh, that formula helps us describe what has happened on our planet, which is that through the use of agriculture, the use of fossil fuels, this culture has artificially expanded carrying capacity and allowed for the mm. population to reach 8 billion people consuming mm -hmm. an obscene amount of products from fast fashion to smartphones and on down the line to cars and so on. Um, and that is inherently a temporary situation because the soil is being drawn down the fossil fuel resources, which are finite, are being drawn down. And in many ways, I look at these green energy technologies as like an addict scrambling and scrounging mm -hmm. and scrapping to try and get some other source of energy. An addict who sees their addiction being threatened, their addiction to energy, consumption, speed, uh, power, sees that addiction threatened and is looking for some way to replace it, some way to keep the drugs flowing. And, uh, you know, that's, that's, I think, as accurate a way to look at this push for green energy as anything else, unfortunately. The movie Bright Green Lies opens with Julia Barnes, the filmmaker, filming you giving a tour of a solar array installation. And the, 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 the trailer of the movie ends with you saying, this crap ain't green. Uh, what were you talking about? What is not green about that solar installation? Yeah, Julia wasn't actually with me there that day. I was okay. filming myself and I just uh, happened to drive by a, a solar facility out in Eastern Oregon and decided to pull over. I had my camera with me and just nobody was around. So I decided to climb the fence and go inside and just look around. And what I noticed immediately is that on one side of the fence, outside the fence, you have healthy Western juniper forest. Mm. These trees that are probably, they were probably 100 to 200 year old trees, pretty old. Um, you have a, a, a layer on closer to the soil of shrubs and herbaceous plants. You have, you had a lot of animal tracks actually that you could see in that area running around through the the uh, juniper and the sagebrush and the other plants there. So even though it was next to a road and next to an industrial solar facility, you have 
an ecosystem. You have a natural community. You have beings living and reproducing and storing carbon, filtering water, releasing oxygen into the, the air, and so on. As soon as I climbed the fence and went inside, there is not a single plant. There actually was a little bit of uh, invasive grass, just a, just a few st uh, stalks of invasive grass. Other than that, there's not a single plant. There's not a single track of an animal because it's hurricane mm -hmm. fencing. There's, they've they built it deliberately so that no creatures can get through it. Um, it was a pretty challenging climb for me to get over the fence. And I, you know, grew up rock climbing. So it's, it's that habitat is completely cut off. And not only that, it's been destroyed. They cut down all the trees who live there. They ripped out the stumps. They bulldozed all the plants, you know, bulldozed all the burrow, burrows of the animals who lived there. And they replaced that with solar panels. So what are solar panels? Uh, a lot of us don't really think about it. We see the, the thing, the finished product, and we just think that's a solar panel. We don't but see what how the sausage is made. So Right. <laughs> what actually bit. is it? So you go in there, there's these uh, massive steel sort of frames that the solar panels are mounted on. They stretch on for hundreds of yards in each direction. There's cables leading from inverters and eventually to the power substation. Um, to the electric grid. There's all these cables running in. They connect to the bottom of these solar panels. The panels themselves are bolted onto these sort of movable uh, steel platforms so they can adjust to the angle of the sun. And the panels themselves are made up of, if you do basic research, you can figure this out. They're made up of things like high quality metallurgical silicon, um, also used in computer chips. They're made up of things like uh, cadmium, lead, tin, there's plastics, there's uh, these high quality glass uh, materials that they use in the, on the front of the solar panel. So all of these things have impacts. All of these things have industrial supply chains associated with them. And if you live in the city, like the nearest town to that particular solar panel, Bend, Oregon, uh, there's no mining in Bend, Oregon. Mm -hmm. There's no aluminum mine. There's no steel mine. There's no metallurgical grade silicon mine. Those things are happening far away. And so if you live there, you're not paying the price. You're only reaping the benefit. You're getting the energy from these solar panels. But for the, the wild beings whose lives are being destroyed, whose habitat is being destroyed, and for the human communities who are being impacted by the mining, the extraction, the pollution, uh, displacement in some cases, and so on, human rights violations that are associated with mining and other forms of extraction around the world, you do pay the price. And you probably don't see the benefit. So this is something that we see again and again throughout industrial supply chains, whether you're talking about sweatshop labor and the production of clothing, or you're talking about uh, slavery in the Congo in Central Africa, where cobalt is mined that goes into the battery of every smartphone, every laptop, every electric vehicles. Um, so again, this type of destruction, ecocide, is found not only uh, uh, at the point of production of these raw materials, it's found throughout the supply chain of these industrial processes. And it's a real problem for the planet. It's implicated in uh, the six mass extinction event that we're facing right now. It's implicated in global warming. And uh, you know the problem is not getting any better because we have solar panels now. In fact, it seems to be just be getting worse. So uh, you have been working to protect a place called Thacker Pass. Tell us what's going on at Thacker Pass in Nevada. So Thacker Pass is this incredibly beautiful uh, sagebrush step area in the northern Great Basin. So if people aren't familiar with the Great Basin ecoregion, uh, it's called that because all the water drains inward and then evaporates. Mm. So there's no rivers that lead to the ocean. It's a basin. It's like a it's like a bathtub ultimately. The whole area. There used to be a large inland sea there tens of thousands of years ago, um, but the Great Basin just has these dry lake beds where ultimately all the water flows there. 
there's a lot of rain. It flows into these dry lake beds. They temporarily fill up with water and then it evaporates. So it's a pretty dry place. It's not technically a desert. Uh, most of it, it's actually a steppe, which is you know more similar to like the Mongolian steppe or the Asian steppe in in parts of uh, Eastern Europe and and Western Asia. So it's a very biodiverse region. It's not something that a lot of people recognize as ecologically important because mm -hmm. if you just drive through on the freeway at 80 miles an hour, you might not see the wildlife. You might not recognize what's actually happening there. But there are hundreds and hundreds of species who live in Thacker Pass from the greater sage grouse, this iconic bird species mm -hmm. who are just incredibly beautiful and they're actually preparing to do their spring mating dances pretty soon here uh, in early April, likely. And they, uh, they're they 98% gone since the colonization of North America began because mm -hmm. of overhunting and especially habitat destruction and habitat degradation. Mm -hmm. um, you have all kinds of other species like the pronghorn, um, the, the fastest land animal in North America, I believe they may be the second fastest on the planet after the mm. cheetah, um, these incredibly beautiful animals who migrate through Thacker Pass regularly. You have mule deer, cougars, bobcats, spotted skunks. Uh, you have golden eagles. You have sage thrashers, ferruginous hawks, prairie falcons. You have uh, horned lizards, Pacific tree frogs, even. <laughs> kind of shocking that you'll find them out in this dry region, but mm -hmm. they're there. Um, you have uh, a snail species called the Kings River Perg, which is an endemic species, meaning it only lives in Thacker Pass. That's its only home in the whole world. Um, all this rich life, you have sagebrush that grows to be hundreds of years old. So it's really an old growth forest that rarely gets taller than about your hip. And that's what a lot of people don't recognize about this area is that life is happening in a different scale, in a different way, in a different manner than in a place like the Amazon rainforest or the redwoods, where the beauty and the biodiversity and the cycles of life are in your face and mm -hmm. almost impossible to ignore. Mm -hmm. Life is a little more subtle at Thacker Pass, mm -hmm. but it's incredibly beautiful. It's also very culturally significant to the tribes it's a, a of the region. It's a, it's a watershed that's very significant for the farmers and all the people who live in the area who rely on the drinking water from the snow that gathers in Thacker Pass. Uh, and it's a place that I just fell in love with after visiting it and, you know, learning that it was going to become an open pit mine. I just felt like, uh, you know, because of that capture of the environmental movement, because of that corporate co-opting of the climate movement into supporting things like lithium mining because lithium goes into electric vehicle batteries. I felt like uh, nobody else or at least very few people were going to fight for this place unless I stood up and, and did something about it. So my heart called me to to start fighting for that place. And that's what we've been doing for more than two years now. I almost hate to get into the bad news because of how beautiful you described Thacker Pass as being with the biodiversity, the sage grouse, the pronghorn antelope, the tree frog. And um, but they're wanting to make a lithium mine out of this. What do you what can you tell us about the proposed project? Well, unfortunately, it's not proposed anymore. It's planned and they've started construction, actually, as of a couple days ago. Um, we're not lying down. There's a lot of opposition, which maybe we can get into later. But the mining company, Lithium Americas, which is a Canadian company, um, through their subsidiary, Lithium Nevada Corporation, they plan to essentially tear up an area of about 6,000 acres in Thacker Pass. So an acre is roughly the size of a football field, 6,000 football fields. Um, and dig an open pit about 400 feet deep to extract the lithium from the soil. Um, they would extract that lithium using sulfuric acid. Uh, that would be produced from sulfur that comes from oil refineries. So we believe there might be a tar sands connection here as well, because the, the tar sands in Alberta 
one of the most destructive industrial projects on the planet, if not the most, uh, is a very high sulfur fuel. So they produce a lot of sulfur at, at those oil refineries. That sulfur is sold into different industries and a lot of it may end up at Thacker Pass because they need an incredible amount of sulfur to extract this lithium from the soil. Uh, we're talking, if you've been to New York City and seen the Empire State Building, we're talking two Empire State Buildings per year. That's how much sulfur they plan to bring into Thacker Pass to make acid to essentially burn the lithium out of the soil. So they want to bulldoze the entire area, blow it up, and then use an acid to pull out this lithium. Um, they call this a green mine. They call it friendly for the planet. Of course. Um, because of the end product being lithium, uh, that has nothing to do with the reality of the situation, mm -hmm. of course. And uh, you know the, the challenge that we're facing is that the mainstream environmental organizations, uh, the Democrats and the Republicans both seem to be behind this project largely. Mm -hmm. um, and this unfortunately also isn't the last lithium mine. There are over 18,000 lithium claims in the state of Nevada alone. There's another uh, major lithium mine that's doing exploration right now, just north of the Oregon border. Um, Thacker Pass is very close to the Oregon border and the very north end of Nevada. Um, just 10 miles from Thacker Pass, another company is already destroying more beautiful habitat right now doing their drilling. That's a process for which they don't need any uh, major permits. There's no public input. There's no um, real way for the public to stop that from happening, unfortunately, because of these very archaic mm -hmm. and uh, you know anti-democratic, unjust laws that we have in this country. Um, and there's other mining projects that are threatening other areas as well. So, and that's just not just in the United States, lithium movement mining is booming uh, around the world. And we're seeing as this push for green energy starts to accelerate and gain more momentum, we're seeing the same type of destruction that has been visited on areas which have fossil fuels, you know, fracking areas, tar mm -hmm. sands, deep water drilling, uh, et cetera. That same type of destruction is now coming to all these other areas, but now it's in the name of, of green energy, unfortunately. So um, talk about electric cars. I've heard that lithium, the lithium, like by 2030, the um, lithium that is mined will be 80% for electric cars. So if you take electric cars out of the equation, then the need for lithium is reduced by about 80%. But what do you think about electric cars? Are they environmentally friendly? No, they're not. Um, a, a, a car of any sort is ultimately an industrial product. So it emerges from a factory. Um, it's built out of raw materials. And we can start by talking about what actually goes into the car itself. So things like the steel in the frame, the plastics in the interior of the car and the lights and so on, the all the different types of metals that are in the engine, in the motors, in the braking system, um, the artificial rubbers and the other petroleum compounds in the tires and other parts of the vehicle. Um, a car is a very complex industrial product. And as we've seen, the rise of car culture in this country over the last hundred years, we've seen a skyrocketing environmental impact associated with that. And that impact includes the carbon emissions from burning gasoline, burning diesel, et cetera. It also includes the mining impacts, which include a lot of fossil fuels as well, mm -hmm. associated with the raw materials. It includes the impacts on communities who are facing the pollution from the factories and the production itself. It includes the economic impacts on the communities who face these uh, commodity cycles, these boom and bust cycles of mm -hmm. you know having great jobs come into the community and then having those the rug pulled out from underneath them because the company chooses to outsource to a cheaper jurisdiction where labor uh, regulations aren't as strong and essentially they can explo exploit the workers more to make more profit. So there's a host of uh, problems associated with cars themselves. That's not even to get into the issues with roads and car culture itself, because I actually think 
the most destructive impact of cars may not be the car itself. It may not be the fuel that the car is burning. It may be the roads that are built to service a car culture, to make it possible to drive anywhere. Um, roads are one of the main drivers of habitat destruction and habitat fragmentation around the world. And you know, in the United States, the area that is paved is something like the size of Washington State. Uh, it's a massive amount of land that has been destroyed by habitat fragmentation and, and being paved in one way or another. That's not even to account for all the logging roads and the dirt roads that have been built you know, in other ways. So you know, the whole culture of speed that is enabled by cars is a big problem ecologically. And, you know, we're very used to it. I was born into a car culture. You know, mm -hmm. my parents had a car when I was growing up. It was beater. It wasn't, we didn't have much money, but, uh, but they had a car and they had to use it to go to work and take me to school. And I grew up in the car. I'm just completely used to it. You go back a couple of generations and, you know, our grandparents likely didn't grow up with cars. They were probably kind of a rare thing. Maybe the wealthy people had them later in their lives. They likely had cars. Mm -hmm. Right. So we've seen this very rapid shift happen in our culture because of this technology, driven by the technology. And we've become so used to it because, I mean, and, it's nice to be able to go wherever you want, whenever you want, right? We, yeah, so we that do seems get some normal. benefit from it. Yeah. And we, th that seems normal. And we have this narrative that says, if we want to maintain this, then we have to do renewable energy. And the, the name of the game becomes to maintain the culture of speed, as you call it. Right. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, that that is one of those areas where I think there are unseen trade-offs. You know, when we, it's been said that the real authorities in any culture are unquestioned beliefs. Mm. And I think as long yeah. as we maintain the unquestioned belief that one, we have the right to cars and very fast mobility whenever we want it. And two, that, uh, that, that we build a culture around that. We've, as long as we maintain those unquestioned beliefs that we have the right to do that, then we're going to continue down this path of ecological crisis, drawdown, overshoot, and then eventual collapse. I mean, that's what societies do that destroy their own ecological foundation it's not a it's not a mystery the direction we're headed in um it's pretty straightforward to see what's happening it's happened many times before in history and unfortunately most people seem to be either resigned to it or cheering it on you know i'm interested in in reaching the both of those groups honestly the people who are resigned i think so much of this culture is built around making us feel uh, disempowered, making us lack a sense mm -hmm. of uh, of responsibility and uh, ability to act. Um, that that sort of infantilization or learned helplessness that I think is a big hallmark of the culture we live in is a big problem, and. You know, those in power, I think, rely on it a lot. The corporations, the people who are really um, making the most of the situation, I think they really rely on people's learned helplessness. So that's a big thing for me is trying to empower myself and other people to take action on these things. Because the truth is we're not powerless. We do have control over how things are going to play out. We don't have control over everything. A lot of things are outside of our control, you know, I'm not an all powerful person by any means, but we do have power. And especially when we work together and collaborate mm -hmm. and, you know, think critically and move in new directions and try and shed some of that outdated thinking that subconsciously guides us to believe that certain avenues have to be that way. Certain things cannot change. Um, then I think that's, that's really the first step in the right direction. I love what you say about the real power in any culture is the unquestioned beliefs. So I have a couple of questions uh, that I think relate to that. One is that you mentioned uh, techno-realism. 
like uh, you were on a podcast uh, or you did your own video and you were addressing the question, you know, should we embrace techno realism? And you brought in Lewis Mumford. So talk about, if you would, technology and what what do we what are some of the unquestioned beliefs we have around mm -hmm. technology? What do we need to be aware of? What are some of our choices so that we can be empowered? Mm -hmm. Well, I think one of the biggest myths around technology is that technology is always neutral. And it's only what we do with the technology that matters. And obviously, there's a sense in which that's true, right? You know, we control how we do certain things. And, you know, we, we have real choices that we can make around technology, how to use it, whether to use it, how to develop it, what direction to take it, etc. But Lewis Mumford, uh, one of the, I think, greatest American thinkers of all time, he really developed a philosophy of technology. And he said, technology is not neutral. It, ha it, it both emerges from a certain society, a certain type of society, a certain way of thinking, and it helps reinforce a certain way of thinking, right? So he used the example often of nuclear weapons. Like if you, if you can produce nuclear weapons and you choose to, that leads to certain things. It leads to certain things being unthinkable and other things being um, common sense. It leads to, for example, uh, nuclear arms races. It leads to, for example, doctrines of mutually assured destruction, which is a very pertinent subject right now, unfortunately. Yeah. Right. Um, it leads to uh, the development of uh, universities, research, research laboratories, and a whole sort of science industrial complex, military industrial complex to support uh, the development of these technologies and in some ways the escalation of these technologies. It leads to, um, it leads to, for example, both nuclear disasters such as Chernobyl and Three Mile Island, et cetera, and also attempts to develop new types of nuclear reactors to circumvent those previous disasters, to, to move past them which generate their own problems and generate their own issues. So the whole technology of, you know, there's no, there's a reason why the story of Pandora's box has stuck around for so long. And it's because there's a fundamental truth that humans are influenced by the world around us, right? We aren't living in some sort of vacuum where our choices uh, are the only things that matter. We live in an ecology, in an environment. We live in a world with gravity, with natural laws, with other creatures running around in it. We live in a world with our families and other cultures and political formations and all of these things. So yes, our ideas about technology matter. The direction we choose to take matters. But also, those aren't the only things that matter. <laughs> there are ramifications of all these technological choices that we make. And so... Cars are a great example of that, right? If you choose to invest in electric vehicles, you might think, okay, this is great. We're going to reduce carbon dioxide emissions and that's going to help save the planet. But you might not even recognize that by investing in electric vehicles, you're also investing in parking lots. You're mm -hmm. also investing in highways. You're mm -hmm. also investing in global trade and international shipping. You're also investing in a culture of rapid travel whenever you want it to wherever you want. You're investing in habitat destruction. You're investing in mining. You're investing in all of these different things that just because you didn't think of them or didn't consider them, it doesn't really matter whether you did or you didn't. That's still going to be the outcome of the choices. So, you know, some people, um, some people really are full speed ahead on that type of thing and will choose, you know, like the Biden administration, I think, has put billions of dollars towards electric vehicles and charging stations and so on. Um, you know, they're trying to shape the future. But, uh, you know, unfortunately, it's not a vision that prioritizes the health of the planet. It's not a vision that prioritizes the well being of future generations, I think. Um, and, I think there's a lot of uh, short-term thinking. 
So uh, when you talk about, you know, the Biden administration spending all this money, I think it's $357 billion at last count. And um, you have said that your loyalty is to the natural world. It's not to a high energy hmm. civilization. So talk about why sh should the average person uh, have this loyalty to the natural world? Well, I think the most important thing to remember is that ultimately everything that we have is a result of the natural world. Every breath of air we take, every sip of water, every bite of food, every article of clothing, all the physical goods that we rely on, all of it comes from the planet and it comes at the grace of the planet. And, you know, we could even take this deeper. Um, the engaged Buddhists talk about the concept of interbeing. And they talk about the reality that human beings emerge from other life forms through evolution. And as far as we know, life began somewhat spontaneously on this planet. What that means is that inanimate matter became animate matter and then became us, that there's a continuum between us and stone and the earth itself, the soil, uh, the air the water, the water that is circulating in our blood and in our stomach and throughout every cell in our bodies has been all over the planet and it will be all over the planet again. And there's a very real sense in which to believe there's some sort of separation between us and the planet is inaccurate. It's wrong. <laughs> you know, we are of the planet and the planet is of us. And when you that doesn't mean we're not individuals. That doesn't mean, you know, there's not a, a useful understanding of reality and, and the boundaries between different beings. That is useful. That's just one layer. That's a more superficial layer of reality. The truth is there is no separation between us and all other life and non-life, non-alive things on this planet. We're all part of the circulation of matter and energy. And that's sort of some people may look at that as sort of woo woo, but you know, to me, that's actually it's a very real, hard headed scientific thing. If that's the way you think, that's that's also true from that mindset. Um, I think that biocentrism is ultimately an adaptive mindset. I think there's a reason why if you look at indigenous peoples and communities that have lived in place around the planet for thousands of years, you find this almost universal worldview, which has a reverence for the natural world, which looks at us as uh, you know, lesser in many ways than rivers and mountains and other life forms that sees us as one participant in this greater process of life unfolding. I think that is an adaptive mindset. In other words, that, uh, that worldview supports the flourishing of our species over the long term. And if you have a mindset, uh, on the other hand, that's common today, an anthropocentric mindset that says humans are separate from nature, we're the only beings that matter, our needs come first, other life forms aren't animate or aren't intelligent or aren't important. Um, we can take whatever we want from the world and we should to develop our own power and, and strength and grow and so on. Um, that common mindset is ultimately self-destructive because it will lead to the destruction of those systems that provide our food, our water, our sustenance, everything that we rely on. And we're seeing that play out right now. You know, this isn't, this isn't a, a theory. This is, this is an observable reality that anyone can look at. You don't have to be a scientist. Um, and so I think that, um, you know, within that, there are layers that are challenging, right? There's the layer that there are currently 8 billion people on the planet and the only way those people are being fed is through fossil fuels, fossil fuel fertilizer, industrial agriculture, gigantic tractors, international mm -hmm. shipping of grain and different foods and so on. That's a conundrum. 
right? It, it's not even a problem. It's beyond a problem. It's a conundrum because that system is unsustainable. It's based on non-renewable resources. It's destroying the soil, destroying the oceans, poisoning rivers, leading to these dead zones, mm -hmm. all this pollution, all these problems. And yet we're pretty much reliant on it for now. So we face these real questions about how do we transition from where we're at to where we need to go? I think all of those problems are, I don't want to say solvable because that implies no hardship, no difficulty, no struggle, no, that implies ease. <laughs> and I don't think it's going to be easy to solve those things. I don't want to give people a false sense that it will be. But I do think that if we shift our allegiance to the planet, if we adopt a biocentric, almost animistic worldview that sees humans as part of this greater continuum of life and matter on this planet, and we have the humility to to grow up and evolve that way um, in a way that our ancestors already understood, right? That we've sort of become infantilized by this culture that we live in now that sees us as separate and as better than and so on. Um, that that is, that if we make that shift, then the problems become things that we can handle. Doesn't mean they'll be easy, but they're, they're things that we can handle. Um, so that that's my rambly spiel for <laughs> biocentrism. Well, let me run this by you. Uh, when you mention industrial agriculture, I'm inclined to think that industrial agriculture, such as it is, it's just it's just a system. It's a method. It's something that we've fallen into, and for now, it's what we depend on. But it's not the way it has to be. And I'm inclined to think. Uh, you know, having studied regenerative agriculture and ecosystems, I'm inclined to think that we, the, the industrial agriculture degrades the carrying capacity, not just for, for, for humans and for wildlife. And if we shifted to a form of food production that is more life-giving and less toxic and, and tends to be compatible with ecosystems, uh, then and, and and can nurture and support ecosystems that you know I know population is I have my own little philosophy about population I don't think population per se is a concern it's what people do but you know I I just think that the earth has productive capacity to support both humans and wildlife whether we'll switch to it is is another question but I think we could definitely go in that direction. I mean, we have fields being plowed, uh, you know, tillage, chemical fertilizers, uh, toxic herbicides, uh, monocrops, uh, genetically modified crops. All of this is just a prescription for a decline in biological diversity. It's bad for food production, or in my view, it's bad for um, wildlife and, and water, but I'm talking too much. What do you think? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that if you look at different countries around the world, you already see some negative population growth in some areas. And what we find is that when people are given full reproductive control and are educated and have their basic needs met, generally they choose to have two children on average, which is below the replacement level mm -hmm. um, or about at the replacement level. So, you know, in my view, I think it is a serious problem. If you look at especially the issues around nitrogen, um, the majority of nitrogen in our bodies uh, comes from fossil fuels via the Hopper Bosch process, a, a way of turning using natural gas to to pull nitrogen out of the air and and fix it in artificial fertilizers. Um, that that's not going to continue in the future. But my, I guess my point is that these problems are solvable. Mm -hmm. We need to muster the political will. We need to educate people. We need to organize to overcome some of the challenges to this. Um, some of the religious extremism, I think, is a big issue on this. Um, but you know, I think regardless of what your perspective exactly is on population and what a sustainable population is and so on, 
I think almost everyone would agree, except for somebody like Elon Musk, that we have an issue and we need to figure out what to do about it. Um, and I think there are some real ways forward. Um, there's not that much political will behind them, which is uh, is really unfortunate and is something that you know I'm working and I think we should all try and work towards um, towards some solutions, towards moving in a positive direction. Well, Max, uh, this has been a wonderful conversation. What thoughts would you like to leave with our audience? Well, thank you for having me on, Hart. I really appreciate it. Um, I hope people will take a look at Bright Green Lies and hopefully get something out of it. If folks want to learn more about the Protect Back or Pass campaign, you can find it on social media. You can connect with me on social media or check out the website protectbackerpass.org. We definitely need volunteers. We need donors to support what we're doing. It's all a grassroots effort. We're not getting any fossil fuel money. We're not getting any big foundation money or corporate money. Um, it's just small donors supporting what we're doing and making it happen. Um, so yeah, I hope people get something out of this conversation and, and uh, are moved to ultimately start to take action in all the different forms that that looks like. I want to put in a plug for Bright Green Lies. I've been a climate reporter for four years, and Bright Green Lies is the definitive work in this, uh, in a critique, not only a critique of renewable energy and electric vehicles, but recycling. And it's a, it's a way of understanding industrial civilization. It is written by my guest, Max Welbert, and also by Derek Jensen and Lear Keith. The movie Bright Green Lies is also very good, written by Julie. Barnes, the uh, the 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 book. Um, the if you if you're into audio books, the audio is extremely well done. It is just an education. It should be required reading for every environmentalist. You if you don't if expose yourself to this kind of critique of renewable energy and techno utopianism, then you maybe uh, would do well to expose yourself to that. It's better to know ahead of time what we're getting into before we get 10, down, 10 years down the road and say, we've been listening to the wrong people, following the wrong people, believing the wrong people, trusting the wrong people. So Max, thank you so much for writing that book. It's extremely well-researched. Um, and uh, I'll uh, and thank you for what you're doing in Thacker Pass. It's truly inspiring to hear you uh, describe Thacker Pass as it is and as it should remain. I know it can be discouraging probably to to do that work, but you are absolutely on the front lines and doing what needs to be done. So thank you. Thank you so much, Hart. I really appreciate that. Uh, so Max, have a great day, and uh, listeners, get bright green lies and look for Thacker Pass online. What's the name of the organization? Uh, Protect Thacker Protect Pass. Thacker Pass. Look, look online for Protect Thacker Pass. Thank you, Max. Thank you.